Boris from Kisim. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you very much for your kind introduction. It is my pleasure to be among you this uh, evening. I visited Ch Chicago for the first time two years and a half ago. It was a short stay in Chicago. In Chicago. And, and uh, it was my pleasure to, to visit you again. Ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. Man questioning himself on the origin of his species initially had at his disposal for reflections, traditions and superstition passed on from generation to generation and for which the source material is lost in the darkness of time. In a secondary stage, and before science was in a position to shed some light on the problem, as it is the case in our days, religious teachings and various philosophical systems brought elements for reflection. We must emphasize the influence on the human mind of the teachings of the scriptures of the three monotheistic religions. During many centuries, the only source of ideas consisted of notions drawn from them. The divine revelation was initially communicated by word of mouth and then in written form. One can only speculate on the date at which man became aware of the first revelation. As to the manner it came to him, are we not permitted to suppose that Noah was the first to bring this subject to the attention of his people? The Bibles make a reference to this fact, and we take from the Quran the idea that the first call to man to meditate on its origin was made by Noah. The most ancient text of the Holy Scriptures that we possess and which deals with human origins as creative work of God are without doubt based on what we presently know about the two Yahvist and sacerdotal narratives of the Bible. The Yahvist version of the Bible, the most ancient one, is today considered to have been written in the ninth or century before Christ. The most recent version, the sacerdotal version of the Bible, is the work of the priest of the sixth century before Christ. It contains a lengthy narrative of the creation placed at the beginning of all the copies of the Bible. Christianity, naturally, took up the idea of creation and repeated the biblical teachings concerning the origin of man, without offering more details on this issue than those contained in the Old Testament. Nevertheless, there is an exception for the genealogies of Jesus, especially in the Gospel of Luke, tracing back to Adam and showing Jesus preceded by 76 generations of human beings, which today is untenable. The Quranic revelation considerably enriched man with data about himself, as it did otherwise for all the works of God concerning the creation and organization of the inanimate world as well as the living world. Thus, during many centuries, on the question of the origins, human mind in the West fed itself, if I may say so, on biblical teachings. Whereas in the Islamic world, the Quran, in the meantime, brought not only the general idea of the creation common to the three monotheistic religions, but also further teachings concerning man himself, new teachings since non-existent in the Bible and to which I will refer later. 
The next stage is when, during the 18th century of the Christian era, science registered its initial major progress. As soon as man came to possess scientific knowledge, even rudimentary and really insufficient to arrive at a formal conclusion, this, nevertheless, led him to develop various speculations. The error of, of most of the scientists in their way of reasoning lies in the fact that they strictly apply to the case of man the finding which have not even a definitive significance for the animal kingdom. They did it from pure analogy. This fault in the drawing of conclusion explains what will follow jointly with their fondness for ideologies. Thus the philosophers did not hesitate to construct theories which were founded on very fragile bases. This is also observed today. In the West, the 19th century was the time of the first dispute with the religious teachings, essentially with those of the Bible, particularly bearing on the fixity of the species through the ages, clearly formulated in the Old Testament. Lamarck, introducing his theory of transformism at the beginning of the 19th century, was the first contender of the biblical statement about the fixity of the species. But it was above all Darwin, in the second half of the 19th century, who dealt a severe blow to the biblical data with his theory of natural selection, supported in his book on the origin of species, which appeared in 1859. Darwin had supposed that nature was spontaneously able to bring forth living beings like those whose appearance may be favored by cattle or horse breeders through selected interbreedings. In his reasoning, Darwin forgot that these breeders cannot produce animals of a species different from the species of the parents. Darwin was right when he said that he had observed variations within the species he met in his trip through the oceans on board of the famous ship, the Beagle. But these variations were observed in animals belonging to the same species. At no time did he find a change in a species which resulted in the formation of a new species. In order to explain evolution in the animal kingdom, we need to know what gives rise to the transformation of one species, of one order, etc., into another. Darwin himself, in a letter preserved at the British Library, London, a letter with hypothesis photocopy, Darwin had stated quite clearly that he was aware of having failed to explain evolution. I quote Darwin, but I believe in natural selection not because I can prove in any single case that it has a change one species into another, but because it groups and explains well, as it seems to me, said Darwin, a host of facts in classification, embryology, morphology, rudimentary organs, geological succession, and distribution. Unquote. In this way, Darwin confesses that evolution cannot be explained by his theory. All the problems of value of the work of Darwin lies, lies right there. 
the centenary of Darwin's death was commemorated in 1982 by a host of apologetic pronouncements, absolutely out of keeping with the importance of his work in the history of natural sciences. In my book, What is the Origin of Man? The Answers of Science and the Holy Scriptures, I have shown the deficiency of Darwin's COA and the misuse made of it by contemporary commentators of his work. Today, the existence of evolution in the animal kingdom is perfectly demonstrated. The evidence has been given in innumerable cases with many details concerning the transformations in the course of time, for example, from the reptilians to the mammals. But Darwin never proved that man descends from him. Moreover, he did not ever write it. His followers, among them Heckel, in 1869, claims this without the tiniest argument, for no link has ever been formed between human and animal lineages. We shall come back later to this point. Supporters of modern theories like neo-Darwinism or the synthetic theory of evolution do their best in order to combine the far-fetched obsolete data of the idol with genuine findings of our knowledge. But in no way do they bring together all facets of the problems in their reasoning. They draw conclusions from certain aspects taken from data collected in laboratories where present-day microorganisms are studied without taking account of the concrete facts of past events. That is to say, the documents provided by paleontology, that is to say study of fossils, and corroborated by other disciplines such as zoology, embryology, comparative anatomy, genetics, cellular and molecular biology, etc. In fact, we observe the birth of theories supported by scholars who describe them as depending purely on science, but which only translate the compromises with their personal philosophy. In this field in France, we are well placed to note to what extent famous specialists in molecular biology, like Jacques Monod or François Jacob, who also, however, to have received a Nobel Prize in medicine, could have taken liberties with the facts in order to satisfy their materialistic desires. One knows the fantastic organization which rules the functioning of the cell and commands the evolution in the animal kingdom. How can we agree with François Jacob when he considers evolution as a result of makeshift arrangements in his book, The Game of Possibilities? Or can we agree with Jacques Monod since he upheld the theory of a chance and necessity as explaining everything? It is not possible to admit the determinative role of chance when we know that the organization of a living being is much more highly complex than any producer or any programmer of computers might imagine. I cannot here give the numerous details which I have dealt with in several chapters of my book. Nevertheless, one must insist upon several data concerning life from a general point of view and the functions of the cell. Here, I should like to remind you of several notions which you are not aware of, since to draw a parallel between them is highly instructive. To assert that life might have occurred spontaneously on Earth is an absurdity. 
To say that it came from space is without any scientific basis. Most certainly, experiments like uh, those of Miller in uh, 1955 were able to demonstrate that very small amounts of chemical components having high complexity, like amino acids of cellular proteins, might be produced artificially in a gaseous atmosphere made of hydrogen, ammonia, methane, and water vapor, electrical discharges of high intensity might have produced samples of those components. But it is not the life which is obtained for all that. The reasoning of Miller is erroneous, for there is a right gap between bringing the compounds to combine together in a chemically ordered fashion and producing the fantastic complex we call the cell or even more rudimentary living organisms. A st statement such as this is tantamount to saying that the possibility of spontaneously forming uh, steel particles from iron ore and coal at high temperature could have automatically led to the construction of the well-known Eiffel, Eiffel Tower in Paris, or other towers that you know well in Chicago, <laughs> through a series of happy coincidences. This series of happy coincidences would have assembled the materials in proper order and the result would have been to obtain what was, for the Eiffel Tower, a triumph of metal construction almost a century ago. And we must note that the structure of such a tower is much less complex than the most simple cell. Each cell possesses, if I dare say, its computer. The orders for innumerable functions are given by molecules through which a program is elaborated, including reproduction. In the nuclei, nuclei of the cells, a proteinic macromolecule, the desoxyribonucleic acid or DNA, is the basic element of a system having a tremendous complexity and producing the catalysts triggering specific, specific chemical reactions. The specificity of the latter depends on chemical components which hook onto this basic substance. By this way, coded orders are sent by chemical messengers, and after decoding, specific enzymes are produced, leading to the synthesis of proteins which are necessary to life. The genes are segments of DNA to which chemical compounds are appended. Each cell possesses a considerable number of them, ordering innumerable activities. So the genome is constituted. Even the living organisms, which have not a nucleus like the bacteria, have such a system of command. In the cells, there is a tape of DNA folded over on, on itself a great deal of time, of times. By this way, thousands of different kinds of proteins may be produced, about 3,000 for bacteria like Escherichia coli. In the case of Escherichia coli, the length of the tape of DNA is one millimeter. One millimeter, that is to say, 5,000 times the maximum size of the bacteria. In human beings, where the size of each cell is drawn to a scale of thousands of a millimeter, the cumulated length of the tapes of DNA of all the cells of the body is exceeding several times the distance between the Earth and the sun. More exactly, today one estimates that this accumulated length might be equivalent to more than 15 times 
the distance between the Earth and the Sun. In other words, an evaluation made in astronomical terms. It is not inconceivable that in the future, a precise inventory of the genius in man would be drawn up. One estimated today that in order to carry out such a plan, a thousand researchers, engineers, and technicians would have to work on it during 30,000 years. If we suppose that every chemical basic compound, that is to say in the present case, every nucleotide, will be represented by a letter in books having collected the information only concerning a human being, one will need 2,000 medium-sized books, each one of 500 pages. You easily imagine the length of shelves of the bookcase. And behold, such a fantastic number of data are contained in every nucleus of our cells, whose size is evaluated on a scale of thousands of a millimeter. Its volume is so tiny that if the whole genetic inheritance of the approximate number of 5 billion human beings living on Earth were gathered in order to form a world, the total mass would not exceed the volume of one cubic centimeter. Is a human brain in, in a position to conceive such a miniaturization in computer programming? The basic characteristic of the living organisms is the fantastic organization. The genius order the functions of every cell. While man is able voluntarily to influence certain aspects of the function of the organs, in the animals most of the functions are totally automatic. Due to an extremely sophisticated programming in certain cells, in the nervous cells of the birds, for example. Their very complex migrations are under the dependence of a prodigious stocking of information, inducing automatic behavior. We know the extremely reduced volume, volume of the central nervous system where the program is registered. Through such an example, we have an idea of the capability of living matter necessitating a prodigious organization. Where can we situate the origin of life? As far as we know, the most likely hypothesis is an aquatic origin. Algae and bacteria existed one billion years ago. The Earth is four billion and a half years old. Other microorganisms were found in rocks dating back three billion years. Pluricellular life forms more probably developed from unicellular forms. The most primitive pluricellular beings are likely to have been the sponges, which, although not possessing clearly differentiated organs, already display a reproductive organization that is sexual. From these primitive forms, probably derive others possessing new demands of organ and cells that have acquired nervous and muscular functions. They are likely to have been formed less than one billion years ago. The first invertebrates probably appeared 500 or 600 million years ago, along with mollusks, annulated worms, and the first insect. The vertebrates came later, roughly 450 million years ago. And likewise, certain fishes, which continued to develop thereafter. The first terrestrial vertebrates, amphibians and reptiles appeared some 350 million years ago and following them came the mammals 180 million years ago and the birds 
135 million years ago. This brief survey showed the magnitude of the evolution in the animal kingdom toward ever more developed and complex forms in a perfectly ordered manner, suggesting that its explanation by chance is impossible. The genetic code which controls the function of each of our cells is the director having control over all transformations that arrive in an orderly, non-chaotic manner. When a new characteristic appeared in evolution, it, this was the obligatory reply to an order from one or more specific genus. Evolution has perpetually been the creator of increasing complex forms among the animals and the plants. Thus, when one studies the infinitely small in living being, one arrives at the notion that everything is entirely programmed at the level of the genetic code exercising its control over extremely complex functions in connection with anatomic modifications. How can the existence of a programmer be found incompatible with science? Even further, how can an objective and impartial scientist of our age avoid the impossibility of explanation of this extraordinary arrangement of the phenomena of life which would depend on the notion of chance? Or then, can one rely on how formulate preconceived ideas such as Darwin natural selection, which in no way explain that we know today of evolution. What characterizes a living being is the information recorded in the genetic code. The latter contains the specifications concerning its morphology and functions of every kind. Evolution, as we know, is quite obviously dependent on a process of successive additions of informational data over the course of time. Scientists can argue ad infinitum about the causes determining the fact, but they cannot get away from the fact itself because it is patently obvious. When certain of today's theorists who claim to have an explanation for anything are asked just to where the point of departure or origin of genetic information lies, they are at a loss for words. Or could they fail to be? Jack Mono has acknowledged the inability to explain it in his book, Chance and Necessity. I quote Jack Mono. The major problem is the origin of the genetic code and the mechanism by which it is expressed. Indeed, one cannot talk so much of a problem as of a genuine enigma." Unquote. Lamarck and Darwin did not provide an explanation for the genesis of the broad basic divisions of the plant of animal kingdom each of which arrive at an organizational plan for an entire lineage. Fortuitous changes in the genes do not adequately account for the emergence of major variations. They cannot create new forms with modifications that affect organs in a coherent manner. All of these events took place in a very long stages. At the beginning, they appeared at the first time, uh, there appeared the first time signs of particular features, followed by a period of accentuation of these phenomena, which was rounded off by a phase during which events slowed down and the creation of new types finally ground to a halt. At the present time, we would appear to be in this final stage, as we shall see later on, however, in the case of man's transformation, in the case of man, transformation came to a halt more recently. 
All the major organizational types were laid down at a very early stage. From the moment a type engendered certain forms that oriented themselves in a particular direction, no new organizational types emerge from specialized forms. In his book, The Evolution of Living Organism, Pierre Paul Grasset wrote, I quote, Creative evolution has its roots in prototype forms. Without them, no new types of organization can ever appear. Unquote. At the cellular level, evolution raises these questions which can now be answered by molecular biology and genetics. No new phenomenon can occur in the cell without the intermediary of DNA molecules, which by means of ribonucleic acid, RNA molecules, is responsible for the formation of proteins that constitute the origin of chemical synthesis. For every important morphological variation, the DNA molecule must acquire a new active gene, thus adding to its fund of chemical held information, or modification must occur in a gene that already exists. Professor Grasset, who was for 30 years teaching evolution in the animal kingdom at the University of Paris, emphasized upon the fact that the most primitive living being could not genuinely and substantially have contained within itself all the genus of the animal, the same for the vegetable kingdom. For him, the acquisition of genes is the absolute prerequisite for evolution. What happened, as far as we know, concerning the human species? Here we must report findings and not theories. In order to make a valid comparison with the statements of the Bible and teachings of the Quran. According to the firmly established notions provided by the study of human fossils, bones and teeth, the remains which have been identified lead us to think that about 4 million years ago, in Africa, there existed living beings gifted with intelligence, not only using tools, certain animals are capable of this, but even making tools to be used, a capacity of invention achieved by no animal. These first hominids were called Australopithecines. I think that this designation, which is beginning to date, is not correct for it suggests a link with the apes from which they obviously differ. However that may be, they had a morphology similar to us in numerous respects, biped posture, for example, although they were much smaller and had a skull capacity of only about 500 cubic centimeters. According to today's knowledge, they represent the most ancient generation. But it may not be excluded that future discoveries will push even further back the date, the date of man's first appearance on Earth. We do not exactly know when this first wave died out. One million years from us, 600,000 years ago, we do not know. The second wave was that of the Pithecanthropes, or Homo erectus, identified in Africa, Asia, Indonesia, and Europe. Their size was closer to ours, with a larger brain, about 900 centimeter, cubic centimeter in average. They discovered the use of far. They will have existed during periods ranging from 5,000 to 150,000 years before our time. With the third wave, Neanderthal man, whose remains were found in Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and Java, the brain develops even to exceed the human brain of today in volume. This wave, it seems, was of a shorter duration, between 100,000 
and 40,000 years. At around this late, later age, the fourth and last wave appeared, bringing in two days Homo sapiens, who seems to have evolved very little to date. A negative fact is of the utmost importance. We have never found the link for knowledge join, joining any one of these forms to any animal lineage, even an intermediate between primates and the lineages that I have just mentioned. At the International Congress of Paleontology, which took place in France in Nice in October 1982, this point was clearly emphasized. Starting with our common ancestor, modification must have taken place for us to end up with different types of the same species. Within the human species, I repeat, within the human species, an obvious evolution has occurred. An impartial observer is therefore obliged to recognize the happening of such events. Throughout the course of time, there have been modifications of the human form, but in no way does this signify that we descend from apes are the adepts of Darwin's half -clay. From the Bible, I have retained as perfectly valid the idea of creation which is emphasized in its text. Nevertheless, as to the present value of the integrity of its narrative of the events, something entirely different is considered. The longest biblical narrative of the creation, in fact there are two of them in the Bible, describes, as I have shown in my book, The Bible, The Quran and Science, the creation by God of the, excuse me, describe as, uh, the creation by God of the animals by presenting the various species are fixed through the ages. Moreover, the chronological data of the Bible lead to evaluate the age of creation of the world and the appearance of man on earth at about 57 to 58 centuries ago. In 1987, now, the Hebrew calendar places them at 5,747 years ago. None of these statements is scientifically acceptable. However, one readily conceived that for the Bible it could not have been otherwise. When dealing with such subjects, the biblical authors of this narrative, the first one and the ninth or tenth century before Christ, are recognized by the Christian exegetes themselves as indeed inspired by God, as far as the truth of the faith are concerned. But having written following the ideas, traditions, superstition, or myth of their age about other subjects, how in this circumstance can they have not committed errors concerning facts on which no scientific light was shed prior to the modern era? It is not therefore astonishing that the Second Vatican Council, 1962-1965, declared that the book of the Old Testament might, I quote, this declaration of the Second Vatican Council might, I quote, contain material which is imperfect and obsolete, unquote. The concept of creation of man is often discussed by those who emphasize the resemblances between man and the apes or other supposed ancestors from the point, points of anatomy and various functions. By this way, they suggest that we might be their descendants. They forget that these similarities were imposed on man, who of necessity was obliged to live in the same surroundings. We take the world in its broader sense, which means our earthly environment with its geographical variations. Thus, man needed a respiratory tract similar to what constitutes the latter, 
in other animals which consume oxygen in the air or digestive tract to ensure its nutrition from the food provided by the ground or the flesh of other animals on which man depends, just like animals are depending on others. These essentials of life lead to similarities in functions, physiology, biology, and a host of common characteristics. Without these morphological and functional resemblances, man could not have survived on Earth. Taking into consideration today's firmly established data of science, we cannot find a disagreement between them and the religious teachings about the creation of man. This concept being shared by Jews, Christians, and Muslims alike. Islam has brought additional teachings concerning man in the Quran. In my last book, What is the Origin of Man, I have repeated that these statements of man were those which impressed me most from a scientific point of view. I even delivered a lecture on this subject in 1976 at the French Academy of Medicine. Now I have fully developed all these elements into books. When dealing with the origin of man, I cannot fail to evoke how the Quran teaches us, in a more general sense, on the starting point of life. I will only quote the verse of the Surah al anbiya Awalam yara al-lazina kafaru wa samawati wa arda kana ta'ad kan fa fataqna huma wa jahalna min al-mahi kulla shayin hayyin afala yuminu. Do not the unbelievers see that the heavens and the earth were joined together when we clothed them asunder and we got every living thing out of the water with his own belief. Who today does not know that the origin of life is aquatic? Furthermore, I believe I distinguish in the Quran allusion to transformation of human morphology taking place in sequence in different phases as modern science demonstrates. These verses have become accessible to human understanding only in the modern era. The ancient commentators, as well as today's translators and commentators, could not and cannot grasp the real meaning only a scientist understands. I shall not emphasize the well-known spiritual sense attached to the creation of man from the ground, which appeared in many verses. But the Quran evokes, after the creation, a second phase wherein God gave form to man. This Surat al-Araf, Lakad ralaknakum, summa sawarnakum, summa kunan il malaikati ujudul yadama. We created you, and thereupon we fashioned you. Thereupon we told to the angels, bow down to Adam. Man was fashioned harmoniously, such in the mention of Sawa, which applies to man in the Surah al hij and the Surah Sad. Moreover, in the Surah al infita it is specified that al lazi Ralakaka Fasawaka, fa adalaka, fi yayi surati masha, masha a, rakabaka. God is the one who created you and fashioned you harmoniously and in due proportion, in whatsoever form you would, he made you out of components. I will follow with the quotation of verses which speak for themselves, if I may say so. Minal suratin tin, lakad ralakna insana fi hasani taqwimi. We created man according to the best organizational plan, for I suppose that such is the meaning of taqwim. As to the following verse, surat nu, lakad ralakna kum atwarand, he created you in stages. I have suggested in my last book that Atwar, which appeared once in the Quran, 
could be related to the transformation undergone by the human species throughout the ages. Indeed, all those who have studied embryology are well aware, aware that it is in the uterus of the mother that are outlined, then settled, all morphological transformation which will fully develop in the adult. The stages through which the embryo passes in the uterus, to which one generally relates the word, are just as applicable to the entire human lineage. Finally, when one has in mind the data provided by the study of fossils concerning the successive waves of human types in the history of our species, how can one not compare these two verses of the Quran with these findings? Suratul Insan, where God speaks of men. Nanu, nahnu, ranak nahnu, wa shadadna hasraum, wa iza shina, badanna an salahum tabdilan. Virile, we created them and strengthened all of them. When, when we would replace them completely by people who were of the same kind. From the Surah Al-Anam, In Yasha, Yuvipkum, Wa Yastarif, Min Badikum, Ma Yashau, Kama Ansha'akum, Min Zuriyati, Kaumin Aharim. If God wills, he destroys you and in your place appoints whom he will as he is as successors, just as he brought you forth from the posterity of other people. These two verses consequently emphasize the disappearance of certain communities and their replacement by others in accordance with the will of God through the ages. What greater compatibility can one find between the Quranic teachings and the perfectly established data of science in the field of paleontology and many other disciplines? Let us remember that they were absolutely unknown at the time the Quran was brought to the knowledge of men. Such is the important lesson that any objective scientist must draw from these facts when we have a valid awareness of the origin of man or could we come to any other conclusion. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for your kind attention. Assalamu alaikum. While the questions are being collected, after you speak, we will be appeasing the limited also question which are not in place in the exact relationship. Yeah. We reconcile Australopithecus as being the earliest human on earth and the teaching that Adam according to Adam, made in the most perfect way, according to the religious, was the first man on the earth. It is an excellent question, but I suppose that the author had forgotten quotation, quotation of the Quran that I have recited. At first, Austra now we suppose that the Australopithecus is the most ancient man known. But we are not sure at all that in the years to come and maybe, uh, maybe the, the later, after that stage, we might be in a position, paleontologists might be in a position to discover other thoughts. 
We suppose that is the most ancient one, but for the future we do not know what will be the discoveries. And second part, in the Quran, you have a verse that I have quoted from the Surah Al Araf, Lakad Ralaknakum Summa, Summa Sawarnakum. We created you and thereupon, with thereupon, Summa, we fashioned you. So that there is absolutely no contradiction between what I told you concerning the most modern discoveries of paleontology and the teaching of the Quran you have quoted. The next question is, what inconsistencies do you find in the Quran? No. no. It is not about the, the matter of the lecture. I'm this question. Please, I'm requesting you to ask question concerning this subject, please. Somebody asked about the healer. You know, we don't want to answer this kind of question. Scripture. No, 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 no. Too long, no, no. The question is, according to a scripture, the age of human being is estimated 10,000 years. But according for science, the age is in millions. Do you have any explanation regarding the possibility of creating different human beings before Adams? Do scriptures deny that man could, could create a different form from the present one? Something uh, is clear, something is not clear. Uh, it is not at all in uh, conform with the modern discovery that the, the, the age of man is 10,000 uh, 10, years. No, not at all. No. The man appeared surely <laughs> much uh, in more, more ancient times. Uh, I have explained that very clearly. And uh, so that there is absolutely, uh, according to science, this age is in millions, of course. But it is according to scripture, the, um, the age of human being is estimated in, in 10,000 uh, 10, years, not at all. Not at all. The, for the Bible it is less, and the Quran the, the, does not uh, teach the, the least thing concerning the, the, um, uh, the, uh, the age of, the, of human being on this earth. Have you an explanation regarding the possibility of creating different human beings before Adam? Not, not, of course, because if Adam is the first one, there, there is, it is a, to, to designate Adam, the name Adam is to designate the first man who, who, who appeared on, on that earth. There, there is no question about that. The, the, the last part I cannot answer because two scriptures deny that man could create, could create, man could create, could be created. I suppose it's something yes, is missing yes, right. in different forms from the present of that one. Two scriptures, but there is no, nothing in the scripture we are, which, where we are denying that. But it's a fact that man is man, and you have not to, to imagine a man or other than the, the, the man the, the, that we know. I cannot understand. Is there in the Holy Quran about the origin of animals? 
Uh, the, Dr. Wang is not a book of science. We describe the, the animals li like a book of science. Uh, you have not, nothing in the Quran concerning the origin of animals. It's the Quran, it is said that we have a creator, the animals have a, a, a creator also. But you have not that in the Quran. But, Protoplasm, as claimed to be the basis of life, existed in clay. Quran in Surah Rahman describes that man has been created by means of fine particles of clay. The Surah is quoted, Khalaq al-Insan min salsal in kal If the theory of evolution is wrong, can we not quote this saying as an indication that Quran has referred to the evolution of primitive creatures made of protoplasm. What is the but I suppose that the answer of this question does not know at all what is a protoplasm. Protoplasm is, some, is in each cell something which outside the nucleus. To, to imagine a protoplasm uh, that, can, that is absolutely in contradiction with all that we know since uh, uh, several decades, but I, I have not to, to answer the, to, to the, about this protoplans, but when you, it is said that Suratul Rahman described that man has been created by means of, of particles of, of clay. Yes, it, it is to indicate that the constituents of our body are, uh, that is to say, the, 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 the atoms, are exactly the, the, the atoms which might be discovered and which were discovered in, in the earth. The, it is, there is no problem of evolution in that. And I have made a difference between evolution in the animal kingdom and the uh, transformation of the human species created by God. And you made a mixture of everything and he, he, exactly if you had not, you had not heard what I have said, I have, ex gi gi I have given the answer uh, di uh, before. Does the modern science confirm the Quranic verse which states that God made every living thing from water? Yes, but... And is the Bible consistent with this theory? The Bible said nothing about that, but it is, I have explained, I have said, I suppose very clearly that everybody one now suppose that the origin of life is aquatic. I have said that, I have given the, the answer. I read, I read of another theory of evolution with step changes. This was proposed to account for the gaps in Darwin's species of... Is it possible that the steps changes were caused by a last will and one of the step changes led to the creation of Adam? I have explained in detail this problem of the genus which are at the origin of any modification in a cell. So that now the theory of, Adam, the theory of Darwin uh, was an ancient theory at the time. We, we, did, we did not know the least thing concerning evolution. Now with molecular biology and with genetics, there is no, no problem to explain the least thing concerning uh, evolution in the animal kingdom by the theory of Darwin. Darwin is finished with molecular biology and genetics. When God says we created you, does not we refer to the trinity or multiplicity of God? No answer. As it is evident that Adam was created from clay or elements of earth crust, it is absolutely necessary to know how the creation of elements or particles or atom, atom was done in light of holy scripture. Please comment. Uh, I have answered uh, 
to the question by my lecture. I cannot uh, give another lecture because I have explained all that in detail. I cannot give you an explanation. But I have to repeat what I have said. Is there any contradiction between the biblical teachings and the origin of man other than the date? I have said concerning the Bible that the, the concept of creation was, was shared by the three monotheistic religions. But what, what cannot be accepted concerning uh, living beings in the Bible is at first the fixity of the species in the animal kingdom and the date of the origin of man. But the Bible does not contain uh, uh, so, uh, so numerous teachings as the Quran. The, 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 two, the, 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 the two important teachings in the Bible were precisely about these two questions. And uh, since the author of the Bible have written their books uh, in close conformity with the, with the concept of their day, with the tradition of their time, the, the scientific errors, what appear now as scientific errors in our day, were, were absolutely unavoidable. Can that, that, excuse me, that does not mean at all that from a religious point of view, many teachings of the, of the Bible are, are not at all to be taken into account. I am speaking only about the, the, the subject matter of, of this lecture. Can all the theories of evolution be accepted or reconciled with the position of those who believe in creation? Personally, I, I am a believer in God, I am a believer in, in the creation, but I think that uh, from a scientific point of view, there cannot be a, any doubt about evolution in the animal kingdom and transformation in the human species. The, the two things are perfectly compatible and they not at all a contradiction between one and another. The similarity of man and animal in anatomy and physiology is because of the same living condition. So, you say man adapted to this system or man was created on this system? Yes, of course. Man was created according to the necessities for the man to be in a position to survive on, the, on this earth. <laughs> Genetically, man and the great apes share a great volume of similarities. There are also recent findings such as Lucy and other connecting links which link clearly man with his ancestral apes. Does Quran say that man was not evolved from the ancestral apes? Well, I have explained I, uh, exactly uh, the, this possibility of evolution as it appears in the Quran. I, for the third time, I shall repeat, and I might repeat other quotations of the Quran I made in, in, in Arabic. Uh, 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 the, like ma man was fashions are uh, monoshne, the word uh, sawa, and many quotations of the Quran I gave you to explain you that it was a transformation of the human species. What are the similarities and differences of the Bible, science, and Quran? I am not really You have to read the book. <laughs> It's too much. <laughs> too much differences, I cannot uh, give an answer. <laughs> In Quran, many times it is mentioned that Allah has not created anything purposeless. How do you account for the presence of vestigial organs in the human being which are quite functional less according to the modern science? Ah, yes, yes, yes. It's very difficult to say that uh, in a, an organ might be absolutely uh, um, 
uh, vestigial like, like you, you have written because they have they, they are in, in the in, it's well known in physiology that necessarily in the course of the embryology uh, concerning human beings and the animals there are organs which at a certain time are useful and later on are not useful later on in the course of the life of you of animals as well as of uh, human living beings uh, considering for example the lymphatic system we have considering some glands uh, um, glands like the thymus you can call thymus thymus, thymus uh, which is a vestigial organ in adult and has the most importance for the um, for the growth of, uh, of of an infant and also that uh, it's difficult to imagine that uh, several things were created, were concept by God, by uh, without any use. I think that that can, you cannot find the demonstration of that, and uh, it is necessary to to know in detail the comparative anatomy to our. Uh, uh, full of admiration for the wonderful organizational plan according to which we have been uh, uh, fashioned as the plan said. What about the president? It's not out. Not the subject matter. We have too many questions. And when is Dr. Bukai's new books going to be published and approximately when will it be available in America in English? Uh, I am in a position to tell you that the book to come in French, uh, Medicine and Mothers of the Pharaohs, I translate, the publisher promised me to publish it in next October and I hope that uh, since the English text is finished, I hope inshallah to have an american publisher but until now i cannot tell you the least thing about this project are adams and eve's literal or symbolic representation in the holy quran scheme of creation it is not symbolic because there was the first man and uh, the first uh, female, the first male and the first female. The male was called Adam, the female was called Eve. It is, uh, of course, symbolic names, of course. But uh, the creation must, must have a beginning. I cannot tell you uh, uh, because it is, it is the habit uh, the, for in the other scriptures uh, the, to, to give a, a name, then you have the name of Adam in the Quran, you have the name of Eve in the Bible, but as far as I know, you have not the name of Eve in the Quran, the, the, the name of the, the wife of Adam. You see, that is, there is nothing to, to, to conclude uh, from this difference. Oh. I actually want to take some some more questions. Anybody Co concerning the subject matter? Uh, it's not directly concerned. Uh, 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 if it is not directly concerned, excuse me, because yeah. I want at first to answer questions which are directly in, in connection with the, the topic of this lecture. If you have, uh, with pleasure. <laughs> No, it's not concerning the like, oh, well, obviously not. It looks like we are getting out of question. <laughs> there are some questions which are really out of order, you know. No, this is why I'm not letting no, finish. finish but just before the two more, uh, 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 we must leave a uh, uh, chance to uh, answer two more. No, 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 I'll give you one more chance before we close. Anybody has any question? 
Write down your question, please. Write down and send to us. The last one, the last one is finished. I must leave it very early tomorrow morning. But I must leave. To, no, no, I must leave very early tomorrow morning. I have a lecture to give in Toronto tomorrow. As well as on behalf of the Institute of Islamic Information and Education, it is my privilege and honor to welcome you, Dr. Lawrence Bukhel, to Muslim Community Center of Chicago. Uh, I also like to thank all the participants tonight. I hope that this lecture has given you some thoughts, some ideas about the creations of human being on this earth. And I also like you to encourage you to read his books. They are very informative, especially this um, Origin of Man as well as this Bible, Science and Quran. Uh, with this short notes, we will adjourn. The Salatul Isha will follow immediately. Uh, therefore, please join me in dua. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أخطانا ربنا ولا تحمل لنا إسرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا لا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به وافوننا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصلى الله تعالى على خير خلقه محمد وآله وصحابه أجمعين برحمتك يا رحمة الرحيم